Let's go to Cincinnati, Ohio. We've got Les Thatcher on the line. Les, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, David. How about yourself? I'm doing really good. I'm doing Great. really good. Uh, before we start uh, discussing current wrestling scene, uh, just want to tell everyone about the Brian Pillman Memorial Show that you're involved in promoting. All right. Yes, that's uh, May the 25th, Thursday, Schmidtfield House on the Xavier campus. Uh, actually, this year, uh, Photos of the Stars starts at 4. That'll run till 6. Overlapping that just a little bit at 5.30, we're going to start the independent match because I think we have so many this year. We're going to run the uh, Indie Showcase from 5.30 till 7. Introduction to the VIPs. Uh, that probably get the uh, ball rolling at 7.30 with the WCW, WWF, and ECW standing to match this year as well. So and, who, 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 do you know who's wrestling, or do you have any matchups made or anything like uh, that? No matches made yet, but uh, confirmed to come uh, Benoit, Malenko, Guerrero, Saturn, Dilo Brown, Road Dog, uh, Al Snow, at least for one of the, well, I'd say one of the two days. You know, we're doing the Mark Curtis fantasy camp the day before on Wednesday. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, no? Okay, yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to have the whole uh, McGill on a press release next week, but yeah. We're doing a fantasy camp the day before for Pam. So this is like a Thursday, Friday type deal? Wednesday, Thursday. Oh, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Well, we I decided we, we thought we'd move the filming so it made uh, get the observer out easier on Wednesday, and then you could fly in on Thursday morning. Well, gosh, Les, that was just really nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lifetime subscription, David, don't forget. <laughs> Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, we see, Dallas Page is confirmed, Terry Taylor's coming, Chris uh, Candido, uh, Heyman has uh, promised me a match, uh, we're not sure what, he said closer in, you know, when he knew who he could uh, spare, but he promised us a good one, we've talked uh, to Jerry, super crazy, the uh, Impact players defending their title or something along those lines, so I'll be happy to get whatever he wants to send me. But uh, the fans that are coming in from out of state will have uh, a whole afternoon of wrestling. So, we're, like I say, and some good indie kids. Uh, uh, we're going to bring some of the uh, developmental guys from WWF and WCW. I'm going to have some of my best kids, uh, a couple guys out of Malenko's camp. And uh, when the lineup's complete, we'll have her out on a press release. Okay, that's true. Tickets went on sale today. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on you there. But, yeah, tickets went on sale ticket Ticketmaster this morning. Okay, great. Brian, anything uh, you want to talk to Les about before we got to take a break? Uh, we're up, actually pretty much up to the break, so I'll let you handle that. Okay, uh, well, you, you guys, you got to go now? Uh, yeah, i got to go. Okay, uh, Brian's wrestling tonight, so he's got to take off. Oh, I read that. Brian, uh, congratulations on your debut. Thanks. Debut? He's been, he got, he got the, he's the tag team champion. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I thought, yeah. you, I thought you were just starting to, I, where did I read that? Up, oh, Dave. I didn't write it. I didn't write, I, I didn't write his debut. I, I, I congratulated him for winning the tag team. For Maybe the, that's what I, it was. I'm, I, I said it was tag team. It'll title. be my debut on this title defense. Yeah, first, first title defense since since he got his head shaved. Right. <laughs> well, congratulations on shaving your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fast improvement. Okay. Before, <laughs> before you go, tell everyone about uh, all the stuff up on the website and uh, Figure Four. And I also got to plug the Wrestling World magazine, which I just got yesterday, which has the greatest photos of Dave Meltzer that you will ever see, the with the biggest old. mullet that you will ever see, <laughs> and it's on newsstands right now. And it's up on the website today, we have some uh, new updates. We've got some uh, new news stories up there. Uh, SmackDown report that. Uh, a few of you have been commenting on that stuff there as well, plus uh, the new issues of Figure Four and Observer, and all that stuff is up there at WrestlingObserver.com. Um, there's, some, there's something. Is the uh, Kane story up there too? Yes. That's good. For those of you in the Orlando area, there's a uh, <laughs> there's going to be a luncheon that Kane will be attending, so you can check that out at the website. <laughs> yeah. Now, so, so tell tell everyone real quick the story about that thing. I can't. You can't. Well, I then I can't. will. Okay, I will. I will. Hey, Brian wrote a story. Um, it was a fictitious story about Kane speaking at a luncheon, and um, he put it up. And then the people who edit our website, uh, they didn't want to put it on because I think it was like uh, the time of the luncheon. The deadline. Might have been no, the, the deadline for uh, reservation to pass. <laughs> <laughs> he put reservation time for this luncheon where Kane was going to be speaking to some like what club was it? It was like the Orca, Orca something. Country club. Okay, some some club, and they so go. The well, he would not speak at the luncheon. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, that's story. It. And uh, we've got a lot of wrestling news to talk about, and we've got a full bank of calls. And we just got this in. I guess this was ran on the AP this morning. 
Um, I don't know if you've heard about this, Les, but I'll just read you the AP story. Republican Governor Christine Whitman and Assembly Democratic Leader Joseph Doria have scheduled a news conference for Monday. Extreme wrestling events are low-budget and gory versions of professional wrestling. Performers often use razors to draw blood. Whitman spokesman Peter McDonough tells the Star Ledger of Newark, which, by the way, wrote in the editorial about this, the primary goal is to regulate the audience and to ensure participants are safe. Doria tells the newspaper one of the bill's provisions would ban those under 16 from attending matches. So anyway, um, man, I just like, I, I, I just, this, this kind of stuff just gets me really, really mad, and I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of some forms of things that they do in, in, in fact, the the antics that was described in the newspaper article last Sunday that has led to this whole thing coming down the way it has. I mean, I'm not, a, I don't really derive any enjoyment personally out of watching guys uh, scrape their foreheads with cheese graters, and and that type of stuff. Um, and if you want to even go so far as to regulate wrestling, and and it's a, and and, it, and it's regulated statewide where everyone has to adhere to whatever the same rules are and they're legitimate rules I don't really have a problem with that if they go okay you cannot use cheese graters or you cannot use uh, knives or or whatever it is or mouse traps uh, or broken glass or even fire in the uh, production of a professional wrestling show I don't have a problem with that I have a major problem with a double standard to where something called extreme wrestling that does Things which does that ninety percent of what it does are the same things that the World Wrestling Federation does um, would be under different auspices, and the very few under six you know like to make a rule because fifteen kids out of a crowd of two hundred are under sixteen at a, a Jersey All Pro Wrestling Show, just as an example, as opposed to seven thousand at the Meadowlands that are watching the same thing and maybe worse in some cases. I just think that that's kind of ridiculous. And then you know you've got. In fact, we need to get. We may we may need to get uh, Paul Heyman actually on the show um, this coming week. I may. Uh, I mean, we well, we always need to. We've always needed to, but it's like this is actually like a pretty, pretty like uh, important thing, especially if this is going down on Monday because Extreme Wrestling, just based on the name of his company, is going to target him specifically, and I think it's really unfair. I mean, whatever rules anyone wants to apply to pro wrestling, as long as they are um, uniform. Uniform and specified. You know, you can't go in there and go, well, we don't want anything like this, and then they'll come like, you know, unless it's a, unless you're a promoter, if they go in there and tell you you can't do, and you know, you run shows probably at high schools where right. you know that they would probably frown on swearing or something, or, exactly. or well, certainly yeah. they would. In fact, a lot of the ADs and so forth that uh, do business with us will express that, you know, and say, uh, please hold down any uh, sexually suggestive, you know, phrasings or gestures and so and like you know our valets we have that we don't cover them up in you know burlap sacks but you know we have to be tasteful or a right. little more so than you know we'd allow otherwise you know the thing and, and i wonder how this is affecting your stuff but i mean i noticed it at, at an independent show i went to a couple of weeks ago at a high school that even though the product presented was not really any different than it was Say three or four months ago, because of the heavy influence of ECW and and the chance of like we want puppies at, at WWF shows, that the crowd, the crowd chants are more vulgar than than say they were a year ago. Yes, I agree. So yes. you've seen that, you've seen that on your shows then. Yes. Oh yeah. I, you know, and and I try to you know I I limit the, you know try to limit the guys that ask hell damn you know I mean we have children you know and we and we try to build a family audience, but. uh no, I know what you're saying exactly. Yes, a lot of times the fans uh, are more uh, vulgar than the wrestlers that would be, and it's, yeah, and it's not you know it's not the older fans necessarily. Some of these are eleven, twelve year old kids because they're because they're influenced by what they see on television. Absolutely, and, and the newer fans are influenced. And you know, it's like fans learn from what they see on television, and as far as proper reaction from fans, I mean, one of the things when you see someone on television get a giant pop. Then when you see him live, you think you're supposed to pop gigantically for him because he's a star. And and when you hear fans react and chant, "We want puppies," um, every time you see a woman, you think that that's the prop. It's the proper reaction because that's the reaction that's encouraged, sure. at least on TV. So at least show us your et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That was the that's the ECW chant, right? Right. Which actually predated "We Want Puppies" by a long period, and pr probably "We Want Puppies" is a lot tamer. 
You know, you were talking about that jersey. Uh, but, you know, I, I think uh, I agree with you that, you know, that there should be something standardized or, you know, it should be the same across the board, a level playing field. But, you know, on the other hand, this doesn't surprise me because these little outfits uh, that do the hardcore almost exclusively, that I can't talk exclusively, uh, don't regulate themselves. I can get an example up here. Uh, right. A company lost uh, about a year and a half, uh, lost, was thrown out of two buildings. Uh, tried to start up a year later and lost it, the building they started in on the first night they started. But some of this silliness was uh, one of the things is that if one of the uh, local junior high schools or high schools, a uh, teacher took away a picture from a kid that was showing it around. Well, the picture was of this kid who was, I think, 14 or 15 with a stripper who would be coming to these shows, not as valets or referees or, you know, but the self Polaroid. And so where did you get this? Oh, I got it up at so-and-so's uh, wrestling show. So then they had the city police in their book, you know. So, I mean, well, let's face it, you know, I'm a parent, a grandparent. I mean, our 15-year-old kids, 14-year-old sure, they're going to see it, but to sell them that sort of thing is just inviting yeah. trouble. Well, look, a, a, lot, a lot of these promoters um, that do some of this stuff do, do, do ask for it and probably – Beg for re you know there are promoters in this industry who beg for regulation. Oh, absolutely. You know I mean? Ser seriously, but whatever. And, I, and I'm not opposed to regulation, and I'm not really. I don't know if I'm favorite because I, I there are reasons, there are days that I think that it, it should be there because of these incidences that we talk about that that are out of control where people who aren't trained are doing really stupid things, and I think you know absolutely. You know, and then there's other times where I just go well. You know, regulation is just a whole bunch of red tape, and what's the difference in, of pro wrestling in states that it's regulated and it's not? And there's no difference other than, you know, taxes and, and hassles and things. Um, well, you know, I'll tell, I'll tell you an, an offshoot of this is over in Indiana, uh, you can no longer run a wrestling show in a National Guard armory. Oh, because of IWA? Because of, or, yes, yes, yeah. because of all the hardcore, all the blood and gore. Uh, yeah. So, you know, in terms of that, it hurts us all. You know, because the National Guard armories are obviously the easiest place to get into, you know. And yeah. And easiest to do business where were. You know, and I wonder about the uh, trickle-down effect there where uh, the adjutant general in whatever state reads in their monthly newsletter or something that, you know, the guy in Indiana did this. Well, maybe I better do it, too, whether it's necessary or not. You know, and it just makes it tougher to do business. Do you, you know, this is an interesting thing. Do you, as an independent promoter who, I, I know the basic type of wrestling that you want to promote, that you train your guys to do, do you feel like pressured now that to, to almost provide a product that you don't like at times because... Yes, absolutely. What, yes. Because the audience is like forcing you? Yes, sure. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I, but, you know, one thing that's refreshing uh, up in, uh, in WWF land, uh, seem to be seeing a little longer matches that are being a little more, you know, using a little more skill opposed to just a quick little two minute, uh, deals with a run in and no finish. And I, you know, I applaud that for whatever reason. But I think at some point you have to give them the product that you're advertising. And I think that's, uh, you know, I continue to try to do that. It's like, uh, we don't do a hardcore match as such, but I'll take and tie a chair to a, uh, you know, a clothesline to a ring, one ring post and a, a uh, big cookie sheet to another ring post, a garbage can to the third ring, et cetera, et cetera. Now the two wrestlers battle to get to these weapons. So there's a little, you know, skill and competitiveness involved in getting the weapon before you're able to use it. So, you know, but, I mean, yeah, we, and we don't do those every show. Yeah, or or every match. No, absolutely. And and we do, we do get color occasionally, but it's for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not every match and not every show. Well, so now here, here's one of the points right here in this thing that, I, that that starts worrying me is because they're talking about performers using razors, okay? And it's like, okay, that's been part of wrestling since before you started in wrestling. Yes, since, sir. Yeah, you know, probably going back to the 40s. What do you probably. mean before you started? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I brought you on that you've been around for longer than anyone except for Dory Funk Jr. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, the, the whole the whole thing is is, is like that's that's been around now. If if they're going to, and then there have been states that have banned the blade, okay? And, and uh, you know, again, if there's educated discussion and they make regulations of wrestling that sane people can live with, I don't really have a problem with it, but when you go, we're going to ban, okay, let's say performers, they're using this as like a scare tactic, you know, the governor sure. is using this thing. 
these guys are doing razor blades, blah, 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 but they're only going after, like, low-budget wrestling. Well, the fact is is that, my God, we could see that, you know, on most Mondays on Raw and every single WF pay-per-view, the sure. same thing. So, so it's like, I mean, if it's that bad, then go after... Every, you know, like you know, like I said, just I just want consistency, and and you never get it when you when you deal with pulp. That's no, one of the reasons why. Well, you know, this state in Ohio for years was unregulated. It was always just city license. Like if you wrestled, you know, you you had a license in Cincinnati, a license in Columbus, or a license even a smaller city like Mansfield. But every every city wasn't licensed either. But uh, just over the I guess the last three years, there's a state commission. They don't really regulate. They just want <laughs> you buy the license that you pay fifty dollars per show for a permit. Uh, they never come to your shows, but the point was when they first, when we found out there was the commission, uh, we asked for an app, you know, for the rule book and the application, the whole thing. So all they sent you was a boxing rule book, basically at that time with boxing crossed out and wrestling written in, and it was ludicrous because they were saying each participant must have life insurance and health insurance, uh, you know, carried by the promoter on each participant, must be an ambulance and crew, you know, in attendance, and I said, I told the guy, I said, listen, do you know what kind of budget these little shows run on? I said, you're talking about just for one night only for me giving you uh, more than my payroll is for two shows, just, for the, you know, just the adornment. Well, and, of course, one... they, you know, they, they took some of that stuff out. But, I mean, the people running it had no clue what the hell they were running. Yeah, that's, that's where it starts to worry me. I mean, I just, like, I have this feeling there's going to be some hastily drafted bill and... You know, I don't know, but um, I mean, there are states where it's actually illegal to do a fixed wrestling match. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> I don't doubt it, Dave. It might be. I think Washington might be one of them. So Brian's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> He's a fugitive already, as we speak. <laughs> That's right. They're gonna they're gonna bust him tonight. Um, before before we go to the break and start taking phone calls, I wanted to ask you your take on uh, this week's situation in Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, the soap opera behind the scenes would draw more money than the one on the scene. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, you know, I heard uh, you were, I guess, reading a fax or an email or something from one of your uh, listeners uh, about it. Fish off to learn lesson. And uh, that was my comment uh, on my show Wednesday night was that, you know, if, if someone told me that he, on uh, WCW Live he had mentioned that, you know, he had been studying how Vince and WWF recovered in 97. And uh, sitting back, taking all this in. Well, if indeed he's done that, and if he's profited from those mistakes, I mean, the guy has done some good things for this company. But in truth, uh, because of an offshoot of how he did these things, that actually planned the seeds for all this, you know, disruption that's been going on down there over the last six, seven months. Anyway, you know. But I, if the guy, you know, it's not to say he's not smart. It's to say if he's learned by his mistakes and committed does something, I say, you know. Maybe it's a good situation, at least short term. You know, it just depends. But, you know, here's the thing, David. You can put anybody in that seat you want. You can put anybody in the creative department, but if you don't have the talent to carry out what you're doing, and they're still six months to a year away, and I, I don't think that's what the people above them realize. Well, the, the thing is, is like we've now seen Vince Russo and then Kevin Sullivan each get two months, and for better or for worse, and neither of them in their two months really showed anything that they were going to turn around. But at the same time, if they had done the right things, they wouldn't have shown those signs in the two months either. No. So if if the idea that those people from above are going like, we need to turn this around, the, 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 you know, the realistic part of it is if they really are building a turnaround, they're going to have to go down more because they're going to have to remove the few people, the, I mean, the people that the few audience members left are still kind of into. Right. Well, I, I and think phase, phase, phase them down and, and wait for these, you know, these other guys aren't going to draw 10,000 people in a month when you put them in the main event. And, you know, you've got to build them to where they are, and it's not going to, you know, that's probably months and months away. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, you know, one thing is they've got to use Hogan, Flair, and Terry Funk, if he, you know, short term, if that's always going to be with the company, but use those guys to elevate the better mid-card guys, guys like Kidman and Candido. Uh, I think Candido is in a position to, to really, you know, show himself, you know, if he can get his act together here. You know, and obviously he's got the capabilities, I think. You know, it's just no, but the, go ahead. The, the, the thing with him is, is like, I, always, I, I feel, you know, I thought Chris Candido had a really good debut on Monday. Right. 
And then I thought on Tuesday, you know, even though, you know, there's, there was uh, the, the storyline made sense, I, I just, I don't know, maybe it's just my upbringing, but I don't think the second match in on, on television in your territory, you're already, you should already beat a guy that you're playing on elevating. I mean, there's no, a time I don't, that you I can, don't either. And the other thing I would do is say that it has to change, I believe. And uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin Sullivan's a personal friend. I have no vendetta, but just sitting on the outside watching is, I think, several of the angles or the, the deals are too retro. And, uh, you know, they need I, – I honestly – and with no, you know, no meanness meant to anyone, if I think if I'd have been making any changes down there, I would have set – I would have tried the combination of Russo and Farrar with Terry Taylor – as the uh, final word from the wrestling end to basically use the eraser and, and rewrite, you know, in the wrestling vein like McMahon did in the North. And I think that, you know, I'm I'm not saying that's a proven horse or that's, you know, that's a guaranteed winner, but to me that's the one I think was more middle ground and built for long term. Well, they may be doing that with, with uh, Bischoff, you know, to being the eraser for Russo. Right. We're going to start with Tony in California. How you doing, Tony? Oh, Long Island. I'm sorry. Tony. Dave, how you doing? I'm How's doing really good. Good. How you doing, Les? Good. Good. Uh, a couple things I wanted to touch on. Uh, you know, uh, I hear you talking about this uh, issue with uh, Christy Todd Whitman. And, uh, you know, I have heard you say in the past, you and Brian, a uh, conversation about, uh, you know, the Mick Foley's and that type of wrestler will probably spawn a whole generation of guys who... Uh, are going to try to do insane stuff and so kill happened. themselves on the independent scene uh, for next to nothing. So, in a way, this is probably a good thing to try to maybe help deter that from happening, wouldn't you say? Um, because nobody's going to... If, 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 if it's done intelligently, I'm not against this. I just think that, it, that it, you need to be fair to everyone from top to bottom. And if you have things that you are not going to allow, they have to be specified so promoters know what they can't do. And then they, I think it has to be where, you know, the WW, if the WWF can then go and do it, or if, he's, you know, it's like, I look at this bill, okay, and the thing that scares me is because it says it's, it's a bill of extreme wrestling. So that means that Paul Heyman is mm -hmm. going to be looked at with a microscope, and there are things... Maybe you know, hey, I, you know, there are things that he did in the last pay per view, you know, like the New Jack Vic Grimes thing, which was which was very poorly thought out and and was a disaster, was a potential disaster anyway. Right. Um, and if it wasn't there, I mean, it'd be, you know, I I would think it would be better for all concerned. But I'm looking at that and I'm going like, you know, you you just can't do a bill and say like, okay. Like because no one under 16 can go to ECW, which I'm not even thinking is the worst idea in the world. But I'm just looking about fairness. If they can't go to ECW, why can they go to WWF, and why can WWF get away with whatever it wants? And these independents who are, you know, most of your independent promoters that don't have and, and, and that are not like Les, who at least if nothing else has a long background of a lot of different forms of wrestling. A lot of the independent promoters that are new. What they know about wrestling and what wrestling is is based on what's on WWF television this week. So all they're doing is copying, and they're being come down on for for doing what's basically copying, or or at worst going a little bit further with a, with a, with more swearing or a few things they may have seen on a Japanese video or that guys that or that their wrestlers have watched on a Japanese video. All right. You know, I, uh, but anyway, um, uh, why don't you go ahead with uh, with with your point? I'm sorry, I bumped in. No, I was just. Getting back to that, I mean, uh, I understand where you're coming from, but I think that, uh, you know, I think more wrestlers get injured now than ever in the past, it seems like. The perception is there. And I think it might not be so bad that there's something, because all that's going to happen that I foresee happening is guys just pushing it to the limit and raising the bar more and more. And these in-ring tragedies, I think, you know, I watched that New Jack Grimes thing, and you could just tell even before they did it, when they were up there, that it wasn't something wasn't right and they shouldn't have done it. And, you know, it's only sooner or later where more and more guys are going to get more and more seriously injured. And these guys, some of these guys on the independents, and I know some guys that do it, some guys who just do anything, anything to try to promote and advance their career, things that they shouldn't be doing. And, you know, you go to some of these independent shows and you see some of the stuff that's being done, and uh, nobody's going to stop them. Maybe regulation might be something to, to, to stop them. 
Can I interject something here? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think, too, we're talking about a little different breed, and what I mean by that uh, is a lot of these kids that are doing this at the independent level, uh, I won't say they have no talent to do a standardized, modern-day version style of wrestling, but I think on a, a lot of cases, a lot of them haven't even attempted that. They just think this is a shortcut to making them as some sort of star, and they think the uh, – you know, the more bizarre the, the deal, the more hair they have on their butt. And, uh, you know, where I think the guys up at the top, you know, and I, I think if they were to speak out in both companies, have gotten to the point where they think the hardcore matches are pretty much slapstick. You know, I mean, uh, and, and, you know, think the dude is wearing off anyway. But a lot of these kids think that, you know, and the funny thing is I talk to, uh, you know, people that uh, run the developmental part departments of both the big companies uh, on a, almost a weekly basis. And they'll be the first to tell you if that's what somebody sends to them, he goes in the garbage can for the most part anyway. They're interested to see if these guys have any foundation, not, you know, how many tables they can go through or how many thumbtacks they can stick in their head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the guys who are concentrate more on the wrestling and the foundation will have nothing to worry about. I think it's just the guys who are pushing it to the limit. Right. Well, I think these guys think they have to prove more that way because they, like I say, not, maybe not necessarily don't have the technical skills, but have never even tried. You know, right. they think this is a shortcut. Right. Uh, a couple other things, Dave, real quick. Um, mm-hmm. I heard something you said uh, earlier in the week on listening to one of the archive shows, which hit home with something I have felt as well. You were talking about Flair at the pay-per-view, mm-hmm. Flair wearing the T-shirt, and, mm-hmm. and, and the same thing. I thought the same thing, and, and that touched on a couple of other things. Uh, like a couple of these guys, and I'll give you two examples, uh, when they had the Berlin character, and they were building him up to be this, this great heel, and uh, the interviews were good, I thought, or were progressing. And then all of a sudden, this guy has his first match, and he takes off his shirt. And he looks like he's about 160 pounds. And uh, another guy is like a Tank Abbott when I see him. This guy should not. This guy should be wrestling with a tank top on, in my opinion. If I was running the company, I'd be making him wear a tank top or a cut-off shirt. Because this guy's walking around with this disgusting gut. <laughs> and it just makes it look terrible. And, and when you said about Flair, I, I, that's the way I felt watching it, too. When he came out there with that blue, I think it was a blue shirt, I said, you know what, I, Flair should be wearing a shirt all the time now because he can still do all the things. He can still work pretty good. He still is great on the mic. But he just and, – and that's why, I mean, it was I think it was Thunder this week. You kept seeing at the beginning of that show, and it was right there, Flair is flabby sign. Oh, and it's it- – it's so sad. It's so sad when I see that, and and you know, knowing that from bell to bell, in some ways, he may be the best guy in the company. And he certainly, when he's on, when he's on, he, he he is as far as the ability to make someone else look good. I think he's still the best guy in the company. You know what? You 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 can fault him for whatever, and I agree with a lot. You know, I think I think it's almost time. But uh, the I think the thing you got to admire is he goes out there and elevates everybody's game. He steps in that ring with, and he busts his butt. You know, and uh, he's not afraid to sell. He's, you know, he'll put whoever over, and which is maybe his downfall. <laughs> Including Medusa. Yeah, and, yes. And, you know, and, uh, I mean, to me it's disrespectful that Hogan won't sell for him more. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's a courtesy thing. But, uh, you know, uh, but he goes out there and gives us all, and I think I appreciate that, rather than see some guy 10 years, 10 years his junior go out there and walk through him. Like his tag team partner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you know when they had that uh, what, Hogan, uh, Henning, Flair, Luger tag match, as that thing unfolded, uh, a thought hit me. Kenny J was the third best worker in that ring. <laughs> Mickey J. Yeah. And that was kind of frightening. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Dave, Dave, do you agree that somebody should be advising some of these guys maybe to dress differently to maybe enhance their image and perception of them? Absolutely. Okay. And I think your points were real good when it comes to, um, you know, Alex Wright, uh, when he came out there eh, without a tan, it really hurt him. And, you know, like, and it was too bad because he had such a good buildup. Um, Abbott, you know, the thing with Abbott, okay, is that the beer gut actually got him over in UFC. I don't know that it helps him in pro wrestling. And, he, you know, the way, you know, but it was a weird charisma he had in UFC. Right. And that people... Yeah, he was the contrarian. He was the contrarian opponent there, because he right. wasn't the one who worked out. He was against the grain. 
Right, and, 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 and it was like everyone's, you know, like everyone wanted UFC to be their fantasy of a bunch of bar fights. But but when the standard of fighting got good, the real athletes, you know, took over. But Abbott was the one bar fighter who could, you know, they marketed him and, and, and put him in matches, you know, where, where against certain opponents where, and he, and he was tough, and he's a tough guy. But um, Until this got guy him, learns to work an interview, or at least give, do some body language and facial expressions, he can still go ahead and knock these people out in one minute. But until he learns those ingredients, I don't see him drawn with anybody, honestly. I don't. I, I think that he's. I think he's dead personally. Yeah. I think. I think. I think. I mean, I would have done. I would have tried something with Abbott, but now, now I think he's dead in there, just like uh, you know, spitting in the wind, to trying to get trying to get him over because. Whatever it is that he brought to the table is gone because all he brought to the table was the fact that he was a real dangerous guy who's real. And now, you know, everyone knows he's not real. And, um, you know, it's like, yeah, you know. And the other thing is, is it's like, you know, Vince McMahon came in and, you know, got to knock out Hunter and, and, and Shane, right? Right. You know, Tank, Tank's doing it with Doug Dillinger, and that's why, you know. I mean, the whole well, and that was, whole thing with that uh, lumberjack deal. He, comes, he does it, you know, for no apparent reason. It leads to nothing. And then off, the interview was so uh, horrible, bland, yeah. generic, you know, that you, you couldn't derive anything from that either. No, he doesn't he, he doesn't know how to do a pro wrestling interview, which is funny because he was not a bad interview on UFC. Don't you which... think maybe now he's trying? Before, he, you know, he's playing at it, right? I mean, a lot of times when I say that, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, great personalities in the locker room don't come across on – uh, out in front of the camera simply because they try to be somebody else. I think yeah, well, I was... Alfred Hayes, to me, was always funny or twice as funny in the dressing room when he was wrestling than he ever was on, you know, when he was uh, doing the second banana. You know, I always thought, like, Ken Shamrock, because I know him a little bit and I've seen him in UFC, Ken Shamrock that you talked to and Ken Shamrock that was in UFC was ten times the interview of Ken Shamrock in the WF because Ken Shamrock in the WF was trying to be what someone envisioned Ken Shamrock should be, rather than be Ken Shamrock, what he is, where, where he was comfortable at. Exactly. He was trying to be an actor, yes. and, you know, uh, acting wasn't his forte. <laughs> you know? Well, Brad Armstrong uh, has such a great dry wit. I mean, I, I've made trips. With, I mean, the guy keeps you in stitches on the road all night. Uh, but he doesn't come across that way on camera because he tries not to be himself. Yeah. Oh, that buzz, the buzzkill thing was, that was a bad one. Bless his heart. <laughs> That's a shame. I mean, because he's one of the, the technically most sound performers in this business this moment. Oh, yeah. But, you know, um, I, I think the whole thing, I, I, I don't know, Les, like, you, you, you're, you're around this because you're around a lot of young guys that want to be wrestlers, and some of them, I'm sure, come in with the idea of, hey, you know, I'll, fa I'll fall on, on thumbtacks, you know, put sure. me in the ring. You know, I mean, it's like, what, what I, I'm, I'm trying to think, what, what, like, I mean, how do you save them from themselves? <laughs> well, the you know, way. the only thing I tell is while they're in my camp or while they're working in, in our little promotion is that, uh, you know, you play by our, our rules. And what I'm going to teach you is a foundation. The important thing to me, that if you come out of my camp, is that you have a foundation that whatever you do from that point on, that you have an opportunity or at least a, a potential opportunity to be try out, tried out in either WCW, WWF, or ECW. Uh, and, again, that's what I was saying, alluding to earlier, you know, when we're talking about the extreme thing. Because a lot of these kids don't even want to try. You know, you notice uh, so many of these guys are wearing the big hockey jersey and stuff. Just we're talking about fat guts a little early, right? <laughs> and, I mean, it's a shame, you know. Uh, you know, to me, the challenge is to see how high you can, you can rise in this business, if that's what, you, you know, if you're in the business at all. And uh, to achieve that, you've got to put the whole package together. And some guys just think, well, this is the way, you know, the shortcut. And, of course, it's not. Uh, listen, alluding to what Tony said, what, what would you think, if, if there is going to be regulation on this business, I mean, is there like a line, you know, even around for a long time, and you know what guys can do without, with, with and without killing themselves on a nightly basis, is there like a line I don't know what's the line. That's what's over the line. What's under the line? Well, you know, you know of course, you know, so it has to do with the skill level of the, of the person pulling the, the deal. Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, obviously, all this really. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. And uh, you know, as good as Mick Foley was at it, he's 34 years old and, and virtually crippled, right? Yeah. Bless his heart. I mean, you know, 
he entertained me, but I, I, I didn't want him to pay that price. Uh, I, you know, I'm adverse to the glass, broken glass, and uh, the fluorescent tubes, and, you know, a little juice I'm not adverse. You know, if the chairs are used in moderation, but the sad thing there is, you know, you can bang some guy on the chair, with a chair, you know, on his head all night, and he may feel like nothing, nothing bad happened to me. But, you know, over the long haul, uh, it's got to do some damage. But that's, uh, you know, I think, again, it's, it comes back to it some degree. Well, you know, I think uh, all you journalists wrote about the deal with uh, New Jack at the last pay-per-view. You know, with no regulation, no thought, no no planning it out. And somebody could have died in that thing. Now, but when is some kid going to try that, for God's sake? And I'm surprised. I'm surprised. You know, I, I told Mick... Uh, right after the, the Hell in the Cell thing, the first one. I said, you know, the sad thing is at some point down the road here in the next couple of years, uh, you're going to hear some independent kid nobody's ever heard of doing it for 10 bucks and just trying to, he thinks, make a name for himself, end up either paralyzed or dead. Guaranteed. Yes. I, I, I'm expecting that one to happen, you know, like weekly almost. I almost expect it now. Sure. Um, let's go to Matt in San Francisco. Matt, you're next up with Les Thatcher. Hey, guys. How's it going? All right, Matt. How about you? All right. I got a question for you, Les. Okay. Okay. I think it was last year, towards the end of last year on Nitro, it was Cage and Flair. And I heard after the match that uh, there was some debate going on in the back about the way the match was called, where Cage wanted to work all the spots in the back and Flair wanted to do it in the ring. Okay, my question is, how do you train your boys? To work it in the ring. Work it in the ring. Yes. Good. I, I don't, I, and the reason I say that, yes, and I, 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 you know, I know Dallas, but I've never sat down and gone over a match with him, but I understand he has a printout on his matches. Uh, I've, I've seen, honestly, I've seen sheets written out. Uh, it, a guy brought me a copy one from an indie show, which laid out an entire match. The problem with that is, is Matt, if you, you and I might burn the cow palace down tonight with a, specific match. We might take that same match to Salt Lake City tomorrow night, and these people might sit on their hands. So we've got to be able to make adjustments on the fly. We can't call timeout, go back to the back, and work out another match. Uh, I was always taught you you know, may put a few opening spots together if the two guys have worked together for a long time. A lot of times you don't talk over anything but the finish. You know, you may lay out the last couple minutes of the match, and uh, for the, you know, I, when a guy says, let's build it in the ring, I, you know, I'm impressed. I think, you know, and it's great to go along for the ride sometimes. If, if I've worked with guys who have enjoyed working with, and uh, you'll trade off throughout the match. You know, I'll call my offense, he'll call his offense, or vice versa. And uh, I think I think the match flows better that way because you can feel the crowd and what they're going with, and if they're not going, you can make the adjustments and go in another direction. Yeah, it's good to see that you're bringing back more of the old school style. Uh, next question, uh, I'm, I'd like to rattle off some names, and, and I'd like to get your feelings on. Okay, Jimmy Cornette. Jimmy Gordon, <laughs> he's a good friend of mine. Uh, sort of a volatile personality, but he's a good guy. <laughs> he's, uh, so Jim, Jimmy has got a very fertile mind for this business, uh, and Jimmy says what's on his mind, and I respect him for that. And, of course, that's one of the reasons that we've both cost us both millions of dollars in the business for over our mouths at the wrong time. No, seriously, uh, Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy's a, uh, you know, a good man for the business. He respects it, and... Uh, it's a shame, you know, he's one of the great managers of all time that he's on the shelf and not working uh, on, you know, Monday nights. But it just, you know, unless you got a 38 D cup now, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Jim Kent. What, 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 I was going to ask you, Les, what do you think as far as, like, the future of, of managers? You know, I, I think they'll evolve back and they'll get some managers back in there. You know, at some point, one of these little frail girls is going to actually get hurt. And then they're going to have to sit and think and say, well, Maybe if we're going to do some of these really goofy bumps, we'd better bring some guys back just who are built a little stronger. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, I cross my fingers every time Mae Young goes to the ring. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm seriously afraid that something bad is going to happen to that lady. Um, let's see, he asked you about Jim Kettner. Let's talk about that. What? Do you know Jim, Ket do you know Jim Kettner? Uh, I don't know him. I, I've talked to him on the phone. We've never met. Okay. What, uh, did something happen to her? 
No, no, no. Uh, he, was asking, he, was, he was just asking what your thought of him was. Oh, Jim Kenner? Uh, it seems like a good a good promoter, the uh, Super 8 tournament he oh. does, is, uh, from all indications. Two of my kids are up there uh, this year. And uh, well, I say two of mine, uh, Chad Collier works with us and trains at our place. And, of course, Dean Malenko started. He and Shark Boy were up there. And they were super impressed the way the uh, production was put together. And Jim's been doing a long time, so I'd say, you know, he's obviously successful, maybe one of the most successful indie promoters in North America. Okay. Uh, how about Michael Modest? From you know, I've heard about Michael Modest, but I don't know him. Uh, but the funny thing is the kid here in Cincinnati who went to school out there, uh, he was at uh, Berkeley and trained with Modest. And he came over to my place, uh, sent us some financial problems, and he'll probably come back and train later, but... He worked out with us a couple times, and I was impressed the way he had been taught because it was basically old school. And then I found out that Modest himself, uh, well, you guys probably know how old is he? Mike Modest? Yeah. I'm guessing Mike Modest is about 27. Yeah. I, mean, but I, I guess he's been doing this since he was, what, 17, 18 years old? Uh, maybe maybe about twenty. Yeah, but yeah. he was trained real well by uh, the, a guy named Ricky Thompson, who um, you know wrestled. You know, he was trained by Rick Thompson. Um, and their schools are very fundamentally, you know, the guys that come out of that the school here in Hayward are, are usually pretty fundamentally sound. Right. You, you know, and, he, yeah. and he's the head trainer. Well, then, you know, because I told this kid, I said, well, I'm impressed. You know, he, you, you've been taught properly. And believe me, uh, that's one in a, in a billion sometimes. I mean, there's guys. <laughs> oh, the schools, guys, yeah. All righty. Roland Alexander. Who? Roland Alexander. Roland Alexander. Yeah. The guy who He's Mars actually the promoter sport. of all pro wrestling. Do you know him? No, I don't know him. Okay. All righty. I got one more one more comment or question for you, Dave. Uh, what do you think of Shooter Tony Jones working in battle art? Uh, I hope he does real well. He um, should be good. It it'll, it'll, be good, it'll be good experience for him. April 15th, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I, I just saw Tony Jones uh, a couple weeks ago, and he mentioned that he was going there. Um it's it's good. It's real good for him to get out and work with new people, especially in Japan. Oh. You know, I think it's gonna be real. I think it's the greatest thing for that for his career that's ever happened. Is is to, just to go over there and and work. And plus, his style his style will fit well with what they do. So sure. so that's good. He is a natural. That is yeah. I've seen him wrestle pro and you know collegiate. Did he did he really beat Steve Neal? Yes. Really. Because he, he told me that, and I was like, he told he told me that he'd beaten Steve Neal, and I, I actually have known him for a couple of years, and he just told it to me for the first time, uh, it's in February, and I was just like, what, really? I mean, I knew he was a very good amateur at San Francisco State, but you know, Steve Neal might might win the gold medal this year. Uh, well, uh, one more. Les, give yeah. me your pick for the Super J. The what? Super J Cup. Wow. You know, I've never had a chance to see an entire tape of that. I've just seen out things. But it's obviously, uh, you know, it's a great tournament. I mean, there's a lot of top talent that's come out of that. Or I've been invited to it. I think it's, you know, it's one of the most prestigious, especially for junior heavies or cruiserweights, whatever you want to call it, in the world. One more name for you, Les. Chris Daniel. Chris Daniels. Do you know Chris Daniels? Chris Daniels is real good. Oh, he was in the he was in the Super Eight. Yeah, he won it. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. Uh, Chad and uh, Shark both told me they were impressed with him. I, I again, I've never had a chance to see him work, but I guess this was his third year, and they said that uh, he was the crowd favorite, and uh, they they were both both thought he was a good worker. Oh, he was the best on the indie team. Yeah. Now he's yeah. the best that WWE's got. I hope WCW does something with. I hope. I really hope WCW does something with him. You know, because they got with him and Modest that are both coming in, or if Modest is, is. I mean, I know Modest is supposed to be on on uh, Nitro Monday, and if they give him a chance, I just hope that they don't like just. Okay, we've got two more indie guys. Let's beat them. You know. Right. I, I hope that they like give these these guys. I mean, that's the one thing. I mean, even even like the other night, I saw. Um, I don't know if you watched the the show. Um, I guess it would have been um the the Thunder on Wednesday, yeah. where Scotty Steiner wrestled Chuck Palumbo. And I'm believe me, I'm not saying that Chuck Palumbo should have beat Scott Steiner. Far from that. But I just saw a, a guy who you know he had good size. He seemed to have good athletic ability. He was not ready yet. Right. And I was just just looking and go, you know, you could do something with him. I hope they don't just establish him as a job or to when he actually gets the rest of his game down, 
that he's been so typecast that no one will take him seriously as a star. I always fear that among the young guys, especially now with WCW, because they've done such a wonderful job of building up young guys in the last five years. You know what they should do down there now, and I know Bischoff, uh, seemingly, or from what I've heard, I don't know for a fact, that he dislikes tag team wrestling. But in all honesty, with the young guys needing the rub and needing to be built, you know, the old formula of take, I mean, never mind that it's one of the top guys, but take a, a veteran mid-card guy teaming with one of the younger guys, and he can teach him a lot and cover the younger guy's mistakes until he learns. You know, it's an idea. You know, in Mexico, they do this every, they do this every year, and, and they have done it in Japan in the past, is to do a tournament, uh, like a television tournament, where you have, a, like, an established star teaming up with a guy who's not. So every team would have, like, you know, be like a Hulk Hogan with... Uh, a lower guy, Ric Flair with a lower guy, and and what will happen is is the lower guy just by being a tag team with Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, as the tournament progresses, they're going to start being taken a little more seriously. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So well, you know, I I think the when they uh, bounce Vampiro up a couple of times and the tags are with the, the you know the top echelon of guys, uh, it would have been better if he'd got a tan rate. You know, I think I think that might happen Monday since he's working with Flair. <laughs> so that'll be the way. It'll never be with Luger, right? Whenever he's no. with Luger, it's like, well, Luger's not going to elevate him, but maybe Flair will. I don't know. You you'd think that that Luger, of all people, okay, would would respect the business and whatnot during the thing with Brody, you know, in the '80s. You think that would have scared him straight? You know, he he would be you know up to put anybody over. You know, whatever's good for business. And, you know, you were talking earlier about Flair. I have to agree with you. That's great for business. And <clears throat> even in the WWF, Rock, the Rock is even doing it. You know, the uh, a couple weeks ago with the Dudley Boys, you know, he put them over. Dudley Boys, he put, he put, he put the big, big boss man over on TV hey. not that long ago. That was hey. one of the things that was drummed into my head, gentlemen, when I was taught this business was if, you, if you're any good at all, you can look at the lights and still... You know, come out of it strong. Sure. One thing that I don't that I I don't understand, okay, and this is just the question of fairness, is that if anyone is and then Luger, this is the thing with Luger, is that like if guys continually put you over to make you a star, wouldn't you you know like just accept the fact that since they're doing that for you, you probably should do it for somebody else at some point. Yeah, that would uh, be your your normal thought patterns, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I feel well. You know, I'll tell you the truth. Years ago, you know, when when you go into a territory and they would build you up, you know, you'd start with the jobbers and then you'd you know work your way up from the opening match on the house show, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I, a lot of times, you know, the the guys underneath who got, of course, I'd been one of those guys too. You know, that's the way we all started back then, unless you were, you know, some humongous, outstanding athlete with a name already, or, or a, you know, a big guy with a humongous amount of potential. But, uh, you know, I always felt uh, it was uh, part of the deal was to get some of their stuff in before you took over. Because, and again, I mean, if there, I, I think today in WCW, there's a place for some squashes just to get some guys elevated that can't go the long haul yet, that are still trying to learn the business. But, uh, you know, everything wasn't always a squash. And in a house match, if you work with, a, you know, a guy basically doing jobs, you're going maybe eight, ten minutes. So you get him some stuff in. He looks good, and you've beaten somebody. And I think that's a key, too. If it's uh, Whether the people know it's entertainment or not, I think it, if you can make it seem competitive, you can draw them in. And I think that's what your job is today. Okay, anything else, Matt? Uh, Les, do you have TV? Beg like, pardon? Uh, the Heartland? Do you guys have uh, No, we, we don't. Not at this time, Matt. Are you pretty close to getting? Gosh, uh, something going. Uh, I'd like to see some. I don't. Uh, you know, right now we're not. We're not. But with these, uh, the fantasy camp and the filming, and we're looking for a new and bigger location, which I think we have found this week. Uh, with everything else going on, <laughs> we right now. I hope we don't get TV. <laughs> no, I, down the road, I'd like to do something like that. Yes, we we do practice interviews in house. Okay. Uh, plug time for you. Uh, where can I find tapes of the Heartland? Where can you find what? I'm sorry. Tapes of videos. Your, oh, videos? videos of your show. Uh, they, uh, I'll tell you what. You uh, put your email address at uh, hwaonline.com, and uh, we will put you on our newsletter, uh, email newsletter mailing list, which comes out once a month. Uh, one of the guys in our organization is starting to edit some of the shows over the last couple of years and is going to do a, 
highlight show or a best of sort of thing to uh, kick the ball off. And of course, that'll be announced there or on our website. So drop your email off there and we'll put you on the list. Okay. Or anybody out there, you know, check us out and we'll be happy to put you on our email newsletter list. All righty. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Wes. All right. Thank you. Take it easy, guys. Okay, very welcome. That's, you know, uh, what's, what's your, do you have any direct or indirect affiliation right now as far as WWF and WCW goes? <laughs> David, you've been crawling around. I mean, I know you're indirect, but, you know. <laughs> well, uh, actually, um, yes, and I mean, I've signed one end of a contract. Mm-hmm. And as, as long as they sign it, yes, I do. Which WCW. One? Oh, so really? Okay. Yeah, a two year deal. Just, okay. it just goes into effect next month. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. It, you know. Oh, I, I was so, tested because they hadn't broke it yet, but, you know, yes, I signed it two days ago, and uh, we've been talking about this. Uh, I've talked with both companies, and this, uh, the deal with, WWF was very generous, but uh, the deal with WCW afforded a little more for the company for us to grow a little bit. And, uh, you know, honestly, David, I look forward to the challenge of, uh, you know, to trying to not only send some of my kids out down there, but uh, I'm going to be working with some of the power plant kids. Uh, basically, uh, as Terry says, uh the graduate course, so uh, they mm. kind of, you know, it, it's a good challenge for me, and I, you know, I hope I can live up to it, and uh, you know, do a good job for them. So the idea would be that they would like, if they have guys, that they would send some guys up to you, and 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 you'd put them in the ring as well up there. Right. Yeah, we put them uh, put them in shows. We've we've cranked up a little bit. In fact, starting uh, in April, we're going to be running six shows every month, and then uh, plus, you know, I put the kids out in front of the crowd, but then. Part of my job is like taking the rough edges off back in the gym, like the little critique and little things that uh, the average person is not going to see, the spot, the body language, the way they stand, the way they throw a punch or the way they carry themselves, you know, to refine those things just to make it a better product. You know what's funny is, is that that's actually the stuff that's the difference between like a, an indie guy and a major leaguer to me. is It's like... You, I, I, I sometimes you can't even put into words, but you can see it, and it's like right. the way you stand and the way you go into your lockup. I mean, it's like you know how to do it, or you're a guy who's mechanically trying to do it. Right. It's like real little things, but yet, and I think you can see it just in like you know the, the execution of the spot. You know, absolutely. They should all the, a good worker is crisp. The spots are yeah. tight. You know. Yeah. Now, like this thing with three count and uh, the other guys, uh, Hayashi and the other two kids. You know, I, I think I should be an elephant and some peanuts in a calliope someplace. There's, <laughs> you know, well, there's, you know, there's no psychology to it. No real just like a, the only thing I can say for them is, is that at least they're really working their ass off to entertain. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with that. You know, but I, I know, I know what you're saying too is that they're just they're they're out there, you know, trying to do like a spectacular move after a spectacular move. Right. With with no direction, for no rhyme or reason. Yeah. And, and that's you know, and I think that's a lot of the kids. Again, it's, you know, I mentioned this about the hardcore kids, but the kids that are willing to, to do technical stuff, willing to take the time to learn it, I think they try to find shortcuts, too, and they see the spots. But, again, the talent scouts in all the companies are looking for people that are technically sound, first, last, and foremost. You know, and I, and I think a lot of, you know, it's amazing to me, a lot of kids don't want to hear that. Because it does, you know, we were talking about the hardcore thing. Uh, I think this blends in as well. Two guys can go out there without the weapon. I mean, you can get rough, you can get blood if that's the case. Uh, you know, there's no reason not to have a fence match or a strap match or whatever occasionally. But the point is, I think you can pull the people in and do your job if indeed you look right, the package is right, you're technically sound, you know, your body language, your facial expressions, your mechanics. But, of course, to develop to that degree takes time and commitment. And so many of these kids don't have it. I think there's another point too, as where it hurts WCW, and at times it's also even hurt WWF, and and some you know, I think that there also has to be a, a context of what your product is when you when you're trying to do a million things with your product. Right. Sometimes I think that like when you try to get serious in a product with too much clowning, then you almost look look like you're out of place. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I, I like, absolutely do. Yes, I, I, well, I think, you know, people perceive us uh, as a show, obviously, and, and some people think we're funny to begin with. So the last thing we need to do is over-accentuate that. We need to try to, you know, again, like the magician, pull off the illusion that we're actually mad at each other, we're actually competing, we're actually hurt. And I still think if it's theater, and if it's theater, that's even more important than if it were real. So, because, let's face it, UFC is not the most entertaining at times of, uh, you know, combat sports. 
SmackDown did a 4.8 rating, which is the exact same rating it did last week. So that's cool. Um, this is from JP in San Francisco. For less, I was at a show in Peel's Palace in Erlanger, Kentucky, a few years ago near the end of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. New Jack and D'Lo were the only guys from Smoky Mountain that were there. After the card was over, there was a brawl in the parking lot between New Jack and some of the indie guys. I'd seen legit. I remember that. That was legit. Since some of the yes, players were, were five feet away and looked like they connected, I was wondering if you could provide any information on this incident since I've been curious about it for years. Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, some of the kids that uh, trained with me were there that night at the talked and actually working that show and they weren't ready it was just some guy you know trying to get his foot in the door but yeah jimmy what, what had happened there is the uh the people that own deals wanted to change their the structure of the deal that Smokey had with them so uh jimmy didn't wilt under the pressure so pulled out the show uh a week out and uh as it were we were down to al snow and i were down doing tv uh and actually we we're on the way back when all this was transpiring we were driving up the road and didn't have any idea but, yes, that was true. Uh, D'Lo and uh, New Jack went over there, and I think New Jack had been uh, partying down a little bit and, and uh, started to get involved. In, it was actually just to work initially. And then one thing led to another, and the uh, kid that was the uh, uh, one of the security guys was an aspiring young gentleman that wanted to be a wrestler, too. So I think maybe that, you know, he got a little overzealous. Anyway, yes, it did spill out the park a lot, and uh, the police were called, and, yeah, it was legit. Um, this is a uh, real quick couple uh, people actually ask about this one. How's Rory Fox doing? Doing real well, putting on a little size now, and uh, you know his his, uh, his work's improving, and uh, he's got a fan club, and uh, the, the little paperboy gimmick that he doesn't like is getting him over. Uh, everybody seems to you know to really get off on it. So uh, I think Rory will be all right. I think he puts on a little size and gets a little more material, make a good cruiser for somebody. Uh, this is about this is actually about the uh, extreme wrestling bill. Uh, they go, do you think that low-budget, gory promotions can get away with doing the exact same stuff but, build up, but just simply build themselves a sports entertainment? You know what's weird about the semantics? Because I've always thought, you know, when UFC was having all of its problems, I've actually told it to some people here who wanted to promote UFC, in fact, uh, including Frank Shamrock, and I go, why don't you just call it pro wrestling? You won't get any hassles from any athletic commission, and then just present your product. And then and it's like, oh, but people will do this. And I go, well, why not after you do all this and everyone says this, why don't you just have all the guys go to the commission and go, our match was fake? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you're right. I don't know either. I don't know. It's like I just see, like, pro wrestling can do anything it wants, you know, and so you just do it. I don't know. This is actually this is another question for you about someone who I'm sure you fondly remember because uh, you probably wrestled him a million times. Uh, Rip Hawk. He goes, whatever happened to Rip Hawk? I think Rip is retired and down in, uh, I think, New Mexico. Lives in New Mexico. I'm not sure what he's doing. Uh, I know he was at a, a uh, reunion of a lot of the Mid-Atlantic guys in Charleston and Harry Marcus's birthday party or anniversary party. Uh, Mike Mooneyham can probably tell you where, where to find Rip exactly, but I remember Rip was up for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, guy I have wrestled probably a hundred times, maybe two hundred, three hundred. <laughs> yeah, he was a real good heel. He was uh, one of the people that helped uh, build Flair's foundation when he came into Charlotte. Well, that was the, actually the example of uh, what you were talking about. Uh, you know, Ric Flair was a hot shot young wrestler, and Rip Hawk was an established veteran. And they, the first big programs that Ric Flair had was Rip, Ric Flair and Rip Hawk tag team. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the guy says that he remembers Rip, Rip Hawk as being brilliant at working a crowd. Yes, he certainly was. Got a good head on his shoulders. Okay, let's go to Western Virginia. Wes, you're up with uh, Les. Hi, guys. How's it going tonight? All right. How about yourself? Oh, pretty good. Uh, Les, I saw the feature on uh, MSNBC a couple weeks back, and it focused on two trainees that you had, and they made a big deal about the way they eat, you know, to put on size and all. And uh, I see somebody like Shark Boy, who's got a lot of talent, but his physique's kind of out of place in WCW. How important is that uh, when you bring in training? I think it's really important. You know, and that's something Shark and I have talked about. And he has finally gotten settled in back here. And uh, this week, started training with another one of my kids, Ray Steele. I had a good friend of mine named Mike. Um, uh, has a gym up in Middletown, Ohio, Power Station Gym. And uh, it's a tremendous facility, and uh, he works with some of my kids. Uh, you know, they go up there to train, and they've got Shark Boy. And that's the big thing I told him. I think size is the is main flaw. And, uh, you know, another good solid 20 pounds of muscle 
you know, not that that's going to lock him in for life, but, I, you know, it just gives him a better shooting chance of getting back, you know, in, getting a contract with somebody. And I think, uh, bless his heart, Jimmy Hart likes the gimmick and is uh, giving him a little shove, and I think uh, Dean can, uh, you know, live up to the expectations. It's just, I think, besides, well, it's the illusion. You know, this business is an illusion, and I think uh, people are accustomed to seeing racy, you know, tight uh, physiques, and, uh, you know, that's what they want. Okay, anything else, Wes? Yeah, I just want to get Wes's uh, opinion on the power plant at WCW. They turn out a lot of guys with good physiques, but none of them really have any talent. And with the amount of money that the com- that, that company has, they should be doing a better job developing new people. I was wondering what his thought well, I, I think that's one of the things where we come in. Uh, you know, they, they were turning out some good athletes, but they didn't have any place to practice their trade, you know, and see if it actually worked in front of uh, fans. Uh, you can learn all the basic moves in the, in the gym and run through all the drills, you know, but to practice the psychology and actually be able to put something together, you know, you got to do it in front of a crowd. So um, their exp- Terry Taylor is working his butt off down there trying to build a, a scouting system and, uh, you know, put together a developmental program, which they actually didn't have up until this, this whole thing sprouted. Uh, they just had the power plant. But a lot of those kids were trained in there. But except for getting squashed on one of the TV shows, actually didn't go out and work maybe for two or three months at a time. So without you know without practical application, uh, great instruction and, and being a great athlete, it really you know it doesn't. It's a good foundation. It doesn't get you there. Thanks a lot for the comments, Les. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, thanks, Wes. Let's go to Sean in Las Vegas and let's try to run through this as quick as we can. Okay, Sean. Yeah, I know you guys want to get through this quick, so um, let me say. Uh, Less, I'm um, 18 years old, and I live out in Vegas, and uh, as soon as this semester gets over with college, I'm going to be moving out to Cincinnati. And, uh, could I uh, could I ask you to speak up? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, sorry, I was just saying that I live out in Vegas. I'm 18, and as soon as uh, the semester of college is over, I'm going to be moving out to Cincinnati and starting in your camp. Um, I have a question about um, the wrestling business. It goes along with the last uh, caller's comment. Um do you think the wrestling business has enough confidence in it that uh, uh, bigger guys can actually sell to the smaller guys without hurting the larger guys' credibility? You know, I, I think it's it's easier today than it was 20 years ago. Um, David had mentioned earlier, you know, that uh, I promote still some old style. I'm always under the impression, you know, if there's 100 pounds difference, that it's not a contest. And I think, it's again, it comes back to the ability of the, of the wrestlers. Uh, you know, has a lot that plays a big part in it. But I, and I, I think if you're, again, if you're trying to create the illusion, uh, to me, I never saw the value in Mysterio and Nash or Mysterio and oh, Sid. No. You know, I mean, I, I, mean Bigelow, yeah. I, I never thought it did anything to elevate anybody, right. you know. Uh, but I can see the David and Goliath thing working occasionally. I worked at my, I mean, I was never a big guy at 5'9 and 220. You know, where uh, you're just salty and you keep fighting back, and no matter how much they beat you down, it, and it works once in a while, but you can't do it all the time. I, th- I think with Kidman, you know, and I think I, I love Billy's work, and I've watched him grow. Uh, here's a kid who, if he's going to work with the bigger guys, A, uh, it takes away from his style, which I don't like, but B, he needs to put on a little meat too, because I think, you know, you can't put him and Scott Steiner together and make me believe it. I'm sorry. My example would be Chris Candido. He comes in. And they immediately throw him in the cruiserweight division, which isn't necessarily bad. But the fact is, will he ever get out of it? Which I think he can perform in the heavyweight division. I don't know if they, he will ever get out of it. Well, you know, Chris, I think uh, this is the first thing I saw, and, and after his debut Monday night, when I, if I were the Booker, it's Kidman and uh, Candido, Tammy and Tori. Yep. And besides that, Chris can work uh, Billy's style. And, uh, you know, probably two of the best workers in that company right this minute. Right. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, okay Sean, let's go to Ryan in Phoenix. Hey, Dave, how are you guys doing today? Good. How about good. yourself, Ryan? Pretty good. Um, something that I, I've been watching, and it gets worse and worse with WCW, there's security. It's like if somebody does a run-in, there's security there before even someone else could even come out of the locker room, you know. That, that, whole secu- that whole security thing, well, when they, the way they do it, it's so it, it, they have a farcical look to it. Yeah, it's horrible, and you don't see that in the WWF. I mean, you never have really. It's like they don't want other people to do any run-ins, but yet they're doing the run-ins, and then the security's coming anyway. And it, I mean, it just makes it look worse. See, there you go. You're looking for logic. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing I noticed. Uh, 
it was like Tank Abbott starting off the show the other night. I mean, that's horrible. I, you guys were talking about him earlier, and, and I get that. But, you know, and then I, I turned on SmackDown last night, and, you know, at the same time, same thing, Monday and Thursday, you're going to see it. The biggest people start the show and end the show. Yet, I mean, they just they don't get that. I mean, and it seems like it was even like that when Bischoff well, was there for, towards the end of his tenure. I, I think there's several formulas in this business that don't need to be tampered with. You can change, you know, because it's 2000 versus 1950 or 1975, you can change the dressing, the shape of it. But the foundation uh, and, you know, of these things, I think, you know, are important. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that's what you're talking about there is – we, I was always taught you put it whether it's a house show or a TV show you open with a bang and close with a bang. Yeah, because you, you know if you're going to lay any eggs, lay them in the middle where it's you've kind of lulled the people into a false sense of security by that time. Yeah, because you got to reel them in to keep them there. Sure. And if you don't reel them in, they'll turn. You know, if it's a, if it's a TV show, you know they're going to turn the channel. Absolutely. I mean, if it's a house show, they're going to stay regardless. But still, you want them involved. And up, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, up, you start getting the boring chance. You know, twenty minutes into it. Because they just aren't fired up. Well, you know, I, I think uh, one thing, too, is the fans have educated us opposed to the vice versa. And I was always taught we educate them. And, and, you know, you may lose a little business, but if you really wanted to settle things down, uh, it would happen. You would convert them, you know, to what they – because they want to see wrestling. And, I, again, I think, you know, WWF has put a little more uh, actual technique, a little longer matches, and I applaud them for that because, again, I, you know, that, that's what brought us to the dance. Yeah, that, that's one thing I really miss. I mean, I miss those one-hour wars that, you know, that Flair used to have in NWA in the tiny little studio in Atlanta. I mean... I'd, I'd settle for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I use a lot of those old tapes. Uh, we were doing it the other night over to Jim uh, and play them for my kids. Just, you know, I'll tell them you were not going to see any her Karana's here or, you know, Unsalt, but what you're going to see is facial expressions and body language timing. You know, not 50 punches, but one punch that means something because it's thrown properly and at the right time. Yeah, I mean, if, if you have two workers working that are fantastic, I mean, the you know, the old matches with Flair, the old even four horsemen in the little studio in Atlanta, those, they were phenomenal. You well, know, you know, I, I think in Kansas City, uh, Benoit and Hart proved that if you make it, you know, I mean, you take two good workers as the first ingredient, but then if the cast and crew of the rest of the show makes it meaningful. That's the key. Yes, it works. Yes, and that was, that was the, you know, great best match probably of the year that I can think of for pure, you know, match style was that the match with uh, with Benoit and Hart in Kansas City. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, it was. Uh, you give me Flair and Terry Funk 20 years ago, oh. and they don't have to throw a punch and they'll burn the house down. Well, hey, uh, I see you're up against the wall, so I will let you go, and uh, have a great weekend, guys. Take okay, care. Okay, Ryan, thanks very much. Uh, let's, can we get Steve in Montreal in before the break? Okay, Steve, you're up yes. in Montreal. We've got, got like a minute to go, so just ask quick questions. Oh, gee, well, I was going to ask you about, uh, I was going to ask Les about his opinion about Brian Pillman and uh, whether his character would still, you know, work today. Oh yeah. God, he was. That's that's the character to be perfect today. Oh yeah, he was <laughs> in. Oh yes, he he was ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's just so unfortunate that his passing was like right before they went to that direction. Well, you know? he was. You know, he was kind of opening the door there, right? Remember, he took Terry yeah, Reynolds he, hostage, and uh, he was oh, the yeah. one. Exactly. He changed the business. Pulled the gun on <laughs> Steve Austin. Definitely. Um, by the way, uh, Jim Ross and his Ross report mentioned that he was going to try and get there for the uh, memorial show. Uh, he said he mentioned it, and he said he was going to try and get down there. So yeah, well he yeah. In fact, I've been playing phone tag with him. He had uh, we talked about it last year. He said he'd try and come in for the fantasy camp and uh, the film, and I hope he can make it for both. Uh, Jim would be a welcome to Yeah, I told him. In fact, come in and you can help me MC the daggone thing. So yeah. all right. Well, then uh, I know you're uh, right at the uh, wall there. So anyway, take care, guys. Thanks a lot. Okay, Appreciate thanks a bunch, Steve. And Les, I want to thank you very much for doing the show. And uh, Dave, it's always a pleasure. Enjoy kicking play. things around with you. I tell you what, now I'm going to say this in front of the whole world so you can't back out. Your press pass and your credentials are set. <laughs> you know what I would like to do, and I, I'm, sh I'm sure we could arrange it, is to do the show from there. Let's do it. 
Yeah, I we we we'll, let's we'll we'll work on that one. But um, yeah, we can. I, you mean Al will work on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a, that's a great idea. And uh, I'll Dave, I'll talk with you about it next week, and we'll try and set something up. Les, how's that sound? Very good. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll we'll just do the show from there, and uh, you'll have all the guys there. It'll it'll work out great. I mean, and they they want me to go more do more location stuff anyway. So yeah, I'd love to do it. Very good. Let's work on it then. Okay, great. Okay, Les, and uh, we'll be talking to you real soon, and uh, good luck with that show. And we'll and you know keep us up to date, and we'll up to keep updating everyone about like uh, who's going to be there, matches when they're made, and everything like that, and uh, and try to do this show from your show. All right, very good, David. You keep up the good work, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks a bunch, Les. Take care. All right. All right, that was uh, Les Thatcher, and we're pretty much out of time. I just want to remind everyone, next week's guest, Monday, we've got Bret Hart, and he's very anxious to do the show, so uh, uh, we'll be, that's going to be pretty interesting right there. Uh, we have got Wednesday, we're going to have uh, Larry Matisic from St. Louis. Thursday is Jim Cornette, and Friday, Chris Cruz. We were supposed to have him on a couple weeks ago. And he's he written some interesting letters, and he's going to be on the Core TV special. And he's very strong opinions, and you guys can talk about that. And uh, we'll be back on Monday, 6 p.m. with Brian.